grace to you, God our Father and our Lord. Pray. Father in heaven, thank you. We have answered our prayer. We have our service up and on the screen, and we are able to worship. So please hear this prayer also. Send out your word and your truth to comfort, fix, soul, keep, lead, guide, help us. Send out your spirit into our hearts. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Two weeks ago, someone told me I preached a fiery sermon. I bad news, but I just <laughs> um, we are uh, continuing in Mark today, and we're uh, actually, we're back in the desert there last week, and we're still here. Last week, we were talking about um, the desert, and uh, we talked about Jesus' time, how uh, it was um, a time of loneliness, scary time, frightening place, a uh, time of loss, long very, very difficult time. Satan was there, tempting, right, drawing near to him. As well, um, we looked at the people of Israel and how they went through that, and we also considered ourselves and how we go through desert up to today. Uh, and that that is a very difficult thing to do, either when it's illness or family, um, health, mental health, for all these desert. Yet, we saw that as lonely as they might feel, they're not, a, not alone. Because God's saint is God's spirit is there guiding us in the desert. And Jesus Christ went through the desert to be with us, sympathize with us. And so that was kind of what we focused on last week. This week, again, we're in the desert again. But this time we're focused on why. Why do deserts... Um, and actually, you know, why would God allow his people to go into the desert and not even just allow them to go into the desert? We're going to push a step further than that. Why would God eventually? If you have a Bible or you can look at the screen, it says in verse 12, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. So it says the Spirit, God is the one who drove Jesus and in the Old Testament, we know God is the one who led the Israelites to the desert. So again, our question is, why, why would God do that? Why would God actually enter this desert in the dark? Fine. That's what we're talking about. And I'm going to try to give you one big general reason, and kind of more specific. The big general overarching is God loves us. God leads us to the desert and loves us. Uh, it's not up on the screen, but if you have a Bible in Mark 1, look in uh, verse 11. Because in verse 11, right before this, Jesus baptized. What does God say? It says, a voice came from heaven, and God says, Jesus, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved son. Then verse 12 Spirit immediately drove me. Verse 11, God declares, I love you. Verse 12, God says, now get out into the desert. And so, I mean, pretty simple point, but the point is, God's love and the being led into the desert are not in conflict with one another. They're one, you know, he says them in the same breath. And that's not just Jesus. That can also often be us too, that it is actually God's love and I wonder if there's anyone who needs to hear that. You're in a desert right now, and because I mean, when you're in the desert, man, you get it. the easiest conclusion you can come to is God does not love me. God does not love me. God does not love me. But what this tells us is that is not true. We have the definitive statement that Jesus is loved by God and God brought him. Maybe you need to hear that. You're in the desert. God loves you. Love for you is not over. Care for you is not done. Act life right now. Now someone says, wow, <laughs> friends like that, <laughs> it's a funny way of showing love, isn't it? And, um, yeah, no, it, it can feel that way. 
right? Especially when you're in the desert. It can be terrible. Why would God do that? We can struggle to love him. Love him. But what we always need to remember is, yes, the Bible absolutely God is all love. Steadfast love and forever. High as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love to hear him. The Bible also teaches that not God is not only all loving, he is also all wise. And his love desires what is best for us, but his wisdom knows what is best for us. And so there are times God will decree things and guide us to places and situations that seems strange to us, even unloving to us, but it is wisdom and love mingled together. Accomplishing something ultimate. I give you the silly example, another example. I don't mean to pick on my mom, she's a very dear, tender woman. But uh, I, the other one I was thinking about was um, the first time she made me go to the dentist by myself. And, uh, you know, go up to the counter, you know, I'm here and all that stuff. You know, just chest deep anxiety. But yeah, you know, in hindsight, you think this was wisdom above things together, right? And uh, I thank God that she did, right? That is God. Wisdom and love. It says in Hebrews 12, the Lord disciplines love, chastises it. Actually, Mark God's. And so, you know, again, that's kind of the big general answer. Why would God lead us in a desert, dark place in life, a dry time, um, a scary place of time, a time of wandering and lost out of his so That's the general reason. But now, I mean, let's get a little bit more specific. Because you could hear that and you could still say, okay, but why does he lead us in the desert? That's why I want to go a little bit now. And I, I think the scripture gives a number of reasons why God might do The first one for freedom. Deserts, I mean, think about it this way. The Old Testament, why are the Israelites, why are they wandering? God set them free from Egypt. Deserts are often the experience that follows freedom or leads path. You know, there are there you know there are people who often they go through the desert season of extreme maybe of cancer some really horrible illness and I mean and they just takes away their life in a lot of ways I mean they, they, they can't work I mean they feel miserable all the time they uh, they're now they're kind of in a financial crisis all kinds of things. yeah often people in that kind of stuff they have found support sort of will be people where they're sick. They're sitting in a hospital bed and they'll say, never realized what a workaholic I am. And I almost lost it. Right? And so God actually led them into this desert to free them from something more dangerous. There's Likewise, you know, maybe someone's going through a time of loss. It, maybe it's that you know, like Jesus says in the parable of the sower, that cares, pleasures, concerns of this life, joys of this life, are choking out the word of God from bearing any fruit. And so God is seeking to set you free from that, you know, love and dependence on comfort. Right? It could be, and you know, I don't want to be like Job's friend and say, that's absolutely it. It's way too carnal. That's why he's going through a hard time. I don't know that. I'm just saying it could be. That is definitely a step the kind of stuff God gives. And so a good question, you know, if you're in a desert to ask, point prayer is to ask God, is there something you're wanting? Is there something you're wanting? Praise of man, you know, fear of man, you know, love of the world. Is there something you're saying? There's other reasons. Deuteronomy 8, it gives two reasons. I read it. I'll read it again. First, God says, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you for 40 years to the wilderness. He might humble you, test you, 
but what it are they not so uh, Moses tells them speaking before God that God led them into the desert a to humble them desert and uh, b test test them but by them. you know I was thinking about this um imagine you found some shoe uh a screw on cap and uh it just didn't know what was inside it. It'd be very easy to label it all different kinds of things. You could label it uh toothpaste. You could label it, you know, eczema cream. You could label it, you know, uh, like lubricant for your engine. You could label all kinds of things and it's very easy to just say, Oh, it's this. Toothpaste. Right? Sunscreen. But the only way to actually find out what's really inside Put the pressure on until it comes out, and then you find out what's actually inside. Right? Well, in a lot of ways, that's kind of us, right? It's very easy to say we talk about it, but it's when the pressure comes, the desert comes, that's when it actually puts inside of us. One of the scariest talking stories from the Testament. That the majority of these people who were led out of Egypt. You know, and keep in mind, these are people who saw the ten plagues, walked through the Red Sea, saw the pillar of cloud, they saw the pillar of fire, they ate the manna, they actually consumed it, they heard God's audible voice from Sinai, they saw Moses and Sinai. One of the scariest talking things is that actually. Bible says the majority of them did not part. They said they did. They said, God, we're gonna we're gonna obey you, we're gonna listen to you, we, we acknowledge you, we believe in you. But then almost none of them entered the promise. And Hebrews three says the reason for that was that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Say, well, how, how is that? Of cloud, you're fire. How could they? You're eating manna. How could they not believe? And this this is a really important word for general North American Christians because this is an area of our world. have fallen, gone into a wrong understanding. Faith is not the same. Knowledge, information, theology, doctrine, these are all important things because they direct us to what our faith will be placed in, but they are not faith. You know, it's possible to say, yeah, I mean, I, I, I intellectually assent to the concept that there is a God, that Jesus is the Son. You know, I, I think, yes, definitely, that he died and he rose again. It is possible to actually think and have that information and to acknowledge that that information is true, yet still not have faith. The book of James says even demons have that kind of knowledge. That's not true. Faith, the Bible, is trust. Trust. For example, Abraham. Remember that story when God calls him to offer up Isaac, right? Bring the knife, and son, kill him. You know, imagine God had said, you know, God, or what? Imagine Abraham had said, God, I, I believe you. You know, I, I know you got a plan for me and for my son and for my family line, but I, I'm not going to do that. But I mean, I'm telling you, I, I believe God. God would have said, it's not really it's hard. I mean, he knew there's a God in heaven. He knew God had spoken words, but he didn't. If he had said that, he wouldn't have trusted. But the, what happens is obviously God tells him, go offer up your son Isaac, yes. And then Abraham takes him up the hill, raises the knife, and then the angel you know, cries out and God says, do not lay your hand on the boy. This, for now I know you fear God. 
seen, you have not withheld your See, Abraham's faith wasn't towards it, demonstrated. He or whatever it was, was pleased and found out what's actually inside of him. He really trusted God. And that's faith. It's not knowledge. It's not information. Trust God. That's why these guys walked through the Red Sea, ate the manna, saw the pillar of fire, could nevertheless fail to enter. Because even though they factually knew there was a God named Yahweh who worked miracles, they did not trust. Thus, they did not And so, you know, don't get me wrong, we're saved faith alone. But that faith is not head. No one gets saved by getting, you know, six and above on college. They're saved trust God. Trust, yes, that Jesus did die, but that he died for you. That God, yes, God has spoken promises. Those promises actually apply to you. God is going to fulfill them. That God has said there's a heavenly promised land and that he's going to bring me there and I trust that even if I fall he's going to bring me there. That's faith. That's faith, right? Trust. And so what desert seasons do when we're in them, again, it's that's, it's, you know, because life's good, you know, got a good job, everyone's Happy, everyone's getting along. It is very easy to act like a believer. But the desert seasons are there to test us, please us to find out what do we act what's actually I uh, heard a very humble story from a fellow pastor, not Nelson, pastor. And uh, he, he was telling me a story about a desert gone, very long, very bitter. Uh, I think there was you know, just very, very, very difficult, dark time. And he was so bad, he basically got to a point where he said, you know what, I, I got to leave. I got to leave the church. It's not working out. I got to leave the congregation. He made up his mind. And right after he made up his mind, he happened. I think he did the first one. John 10, he read, he read Jesus say this. I am the good shepherd. The good, good shepherd lays down his life. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves. The wolf snatches and scatters the sheep and flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing. And he said the conviction that God brought on his heart was okay. Shepherd, so he stayed at the church, and he endured this desert season. Said that, right? And um, but I mean, so it was a test. But from that, it was revealed that no, a love for Christ and a love for Christ's people truly guided. Think of. Marriage is a difficult time. The desert sees a bit of a test, right? Yes, do I love God? Am I going to obey God? Do I love my family? Do I love my spouse? When I said to death in my heart, am I going to? Did I mean it? Was I just speaking words? Do I love Christ enough that I'm going to love my wife when not act of Do I trust God enough to submit to my husband and respect him even when I don't think he's worthy? That's what God gives. Yes, that's what deserts there. They're yes. There. Why? Why does God make us the desert? Well, it could be to free us. It could be to humble us. It could be to test us. All these. Always because He loves us. But there's one other reason we need to talk about. He also leads us to the desert in order to prepare us. 
uh, years ago, I, uh, I think seven, eight years ago, I was listening to a sermon. I was in church. A pastor quoted a quote by Charles. Just entered my mind. It's never left. Always there, rumbling. Times. Uh, I put it this way. I love Charles. I didn't always. I kind of. It was kind of against my will that I love. Um, so I guess he's bad. Uh, anyways, it, basically, Charles Spurgeon he is he is a preacher in the 1800s in London. He's become known as the Prince. Kind of balk at that title until I started. Um, I mean, insight, his ability to reveal things, the word of God, and to apply things. I would say among post-apostolic men, there is absolutely, it's, it's uh, estimated that in his life, keep in mind, this is before, this is in the 1800s, before any recording, or any, all just five, estimated that he preached 10, his autobiography talked about years where he was, Pulpit, four hundred. How many days are? And just thousands, like countless thousands of people converted to ministry, and still are being converted today through sermons, books. I mean, there's times I've read his sermons, felt like a, you know, go like, man, have I ever heard the gospel before? This unbelievably powerful. That and God, and God used him, and God blessed him, and he started an orphanage, he started seminary, just all these uniquely huge vessels like that. But the flip side of all that amazing stuff we talked about, Charles Spurgeon was familiar. He, I mean, his whole life he just suffered horrible physical ailments uh, and stuff. Just cr- He lived with chronic pain all the time. There was times when he would preach, they had to bring a Pulpit, put his one foot on it. His foot foot has such bad gout, just couldn't put any weight on it. And there's times that you'd say that after he'd finished preaching, he'd literally fall back to a chair, collapse, spent every ounce of his energy, he had nothing left. Um, so he physically suffered. And then the other factor, too, was he had just perennial, recurring, dark, dark, dark. They would always come back, and they would just totally pass. Really? Yet, Charles Spurgeon came to that those who were had a point. Later in life, he wrote a, a, an essay called The Minister's Faint. Very good thing to read. You don't have to read it. But in it, in, the, in that essay, he said that he came to realize that those who Desert for God's way of preparing greater blessing. I'll read to you how he this depression comes over. This is the quote. This depression comes over whenever the Lord is preparing larger blessing. The cloud is black before it breaks, overshadows before it yields its daily mercy. Depression has now become to me as a prophet in rough clothing, a John the Baptist heralding the pure coming of my Lord. So have far better men. The scouring of the vessel has fitted for the master. Immersion and suffering is the baptism of the ghost. Fasting is an appetite for the banquet. The Lord is revealed in the backside of the desert while his servant waits for all his awe. Wilderness is waiting. The low valley leads to towering. Defeat prepares for victory. The raven is sent forth for the dove. The darkest hour of the night becomes the day dawn. Mariners go down to the depths of the next mountain. Every you go through depression, invariably, you come out of it, and God will bless and minister. The desert was there as a day of preparation. And that's not unbelievable. Okay. Why did the Israelites wander through the desert? Prepare them. 
And if you look in the Bible here, why did Jesus go through the desert? Again, we're, we're in 12 and 13. If you have a Bible, look at verse 14. Even just look at the little heading there. Jesus. The desert. Jesus Christ went through the desert to prepare him for his ministry. After he goes through the desert, this horrible experience, then he, they, then he goes and he preaches the kingdom. And he heals the sick, drives out the demons. The desert was the place of preparation. And that's true for us. I, I am certain there are people here today who have been through just bitter desert, dry, hot, lonely places, but you've come out of it. And now you are able to bring words of hope, consolation, good news from the desert. Having tasted despair and gone through hope, we are able to walk right now in God prepared you. I'm also certain there's people in the desert right now. God is preparing you to clergy. prepared Christ to bind up the broken heart. You know? Perhaps desert place you never thought you could what God is preparing for is something you never thought you could God you desert prepare Jesus be blessed be that's what he does be prepares to be blessed be a blessing now I can imagine someone saying but pastor I'm called your I don't even know if I've two months left to live. What is and I'm in a desert. What's God preparing me for? I mean, enough. Let me remind you one thing. What is the what comes after the desert wander? God has promised you new and better. And I mean, maybe 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 you are old. Maybe I don't know. Maybe you are going to die within the month. However old you are, we don't know, right? Maybe through the the, the loneliness, the fear, and the trouble that come with that, maybe financial stress, God is preparing that greatest and make that final end. When the shepherd who knows of your sheep by name will call you by name, they come. Who are blessed with my Father, enter in prepared for you. God loves you. Deserts, they're, they're bitter places, they're hard places. They're not, I'm not trying to defend them. Eh, not that bad. No, they're bad. <laughs> not taking any of that away, but I'm saying God is there. God is in the desert. And his love is there. Perhaps he's freeing us. Perhaps he's humbling us. Perhaps he's testing us. Perhaps he's doing it. Whatever he's doing, you can trust that he's doing it. Love. Same God has sent his son. Went through, we talked about last week, the ultimate cross. That prepared him. Sit at the right hand. Have every bow before. And so put your trust in him that he has your best interest in mind. All that he does is ultimate good. And Jesus, just as Joshua brought the generation out of the desert into the promised land, Jesus is even better. Joshua will bring every believer, no matter how feeble you might be, bring every believer to the desert. Lord Jesus, your human words. Comfort your people who are in the desert. Be with those who may be heading to the desert. Strength those who are in the desert. Encourage those who are coming out. Raise up the 
works. Lord, you are sovereign, loving. Get ourselves. Let's stand up. That's right.